Welcome back to the 3N Plus One show. In this episode, we're going to recap everything we know about the 3N Plus One conjecture so far. Then in the next episode, we'll get back to resolving this conjecture once and for all. Okay, the 3N Plus One conjecture says, start with any number. If it's even, cut it in half. If it's odd, multiply it by 3 and add 1, then repeat. The famous 3N Plus One conjecture asks, does every number go to 1? Well, every number uh, anyone's ever tried has gone to 1. For example, 10 goes to 1, and 17 goes to 1. And if we start with 1003, we go through some crazy ups and downs, but we also finally wind up at 1. But we can't just try every start number. So there might be some huge number out there that doesn't go to 1. That could happen if it just wanders off to infinity, or it could happen if it loops back on itself. So there are three ways to resolve this famous conjecture. First, we could prove that every number goes to 1. Instead of trying them all, which is impossible, we need some airtight argument. For example, suppose I make a simpler conjecture, that every even number is the sum of two odd numbers. I might convince myself with examples like 6 equals 5 plus 1 and 10 equals 7 plus 3, but we need an airtight argument that works for all numbers. Uh, so take any even number. Since it's even, we can write it as 2 times m. Now let's construct two numbers, 2m minus 1 and 1. These are both odd, and if we add them together, we get 2m. So that's an airtight argument. No matter how huge an even number you give me, I know it's going to uh, be the sum of two odd numbers. So the first way to resolve the 3n plus 1 conjecture is to make a proof like that. The second way is to say, hey, it's false, because there's a number out there that loops back on itself when we apply the 3n plus 1 operations. Here we would just need to demonstrate some concrete number that loops like this. The third way to resolve the conjecture would be to show that some start number just wanders off to infinity. We'd again need some airtight argument. Okay, the next thing we did was streamline the 3n plus 1 operations. Here's the sequence starting at 17 again. Notice that every time we hit an odd number and apply 3n plus 1, the next number is even. So we cut out the intermediary and just go straight from 17 to 26, from 13 to 20, and from 5 to 8. This tightens things up without affecting whether we finally reach 1 or not. So the new rule is, if it's odd, multiply by 3 and add 1, then immediately cut it in half. If it's even, still just cut in half. In practice, we see that 3n plus 1 sequences now consist of about as many odd numbers as even numbers. In that case, why do 3n plus 1 sequences tend to go down instead of holding steady or going up? Well, when a number's odd, we increase it by about 3 halves, or 50%, if we ignore the little plus 1. When it's even, we decrease it by 50%. We noticed that an increase followed by a decrease results in a smaller number, like when we start with 17 and then wind up with 13. That's why 3n plus 1 sequences tend to march downwards, and every even number that's ever been tried ultimately reaches 1. Actually, every number. In fact, for a number to hold steady, its sequence would need to contain about 60% odds upward moves, and 40% evens, downward moves. Next, we looked at how many steps it takes for a number to reach 1. 26 takes just a few steps, but 27 takes much more time. And it's pretty chaotic, though we noticed that a lot of adjacent numbers take exactly the same number of steps to reach 1. For example, the sequences for 540 and 541 uh, both take 43 steps, and they converge very quickly. In fact, we showed that for any adjacent pair of the form 8m plus 4 and 8m plus 5, they'll converge after just three steps. That's because 8m plus 4 gets cut in half twice, then multiplied by 3, while 8m plus 5 is odd, so it goes like this, and the sequences converge to 6m plus 4 and stay the same from then on. So that's a pretty cool pattern. Then we looked at a simpler version of the 3n plus 1 conjecture. Instead of asking, does every number go to 1, we asked, does every number go below itself? 
if any number goes below itself, then whatever number it lands on will go below itself and so on. And we'll have shown the three and plus one conjecture is true. Now we know that all even numbers go below themselves right away and odd numbers of the form 4m plus 1 also go below themselves quickly. But it turned out we could do much better than that. We took every number from 0 to 15 and recorded its odd even sequence. For example, starting with 3, we get 3, 5, 8, 4, which is odd, odd, even, even, shown here in yellow and blue. We found an amazing pattern, which is that every number has a distinct initial odd even sequence. Every conceivable odd even sequence is represented here. In other words, there's a one to one correspondence between start numbers and odd even sequences. So, what's this got to do with numbers going below themselves? Well, let's say we have some giant number m. It's odd, yellow, so we do 3n plus 1 over 2, and say the result is even, blue, and when we cut that in half, we get another even number, blue, and so forth. After that long sequence of odds and evens, do we wind up below m? Well, to stay above m, the sequence has to have at least 60% odds. That's because with 50-50 odds and evens, the sequence is going to trend downwards. Now, let's imagine not just numbers up to 15, but numbers up to 2 to the thousandth, each number having its own initial operation sequence of a thousand odds and evens. Well, very, very, very few of those sequences contain 60% odds. So we conclude that at least 99.9999999% of all numbers less than 2 to the thousandth go below themselves after just a thousand steps. And it's important to note that we can claim this without having to check them all. We have an airtight argument that almost all numbers go below themselves based on the law of large numbers. Most odd even sequences have about the same number of evens as odds. Now, we also know there's a small fraction of holdouts, some really stubborn numbers that don't follow the rest by quickly going down to 1. Maybe those numbers go to 1 eventually, or maybe one of them doesn't. So let's go back to the big picture. We've got a couple of clear choices for how to proceed. A, prove that every number goes to 1, or B, find some number that loops back on itself and doesn't go to 1. Some famous mathematicians suggest that we work like this. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday we work on A, and every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday work on B. On Sunday, just do the crossword puzzle. I say we go for B and hunt for a loop. It's a concrete task, and we'll definitely know if we succeeded. In the next episode, we'll start the hunt, so stay tuned.